Greetings, loyalists and heretics. Welcome to Iron and Ceramite, where we once again enter the war without an astropath. Hello everyone and welcome to the Iron and Ceramite podcast. My name is John and as always I'm joined by my co-hosts Dave, Hi guys. Glenn, Hi. Shane Hello. and Tom. Hello. Uh, and this week we're doing something a little bit different. For those of you who are watching uh, on YouTube you can already see that we're joined by a guest this week. Uh, in fact, the first guest ever on Iron and Ceramite. Uh, let's welcome James from Siege Studios. Well, How are you doing, James? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, very, very well. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm absolutely honoured to be the first guest on your on your podcast. So big, big thank you. So yeah, really, really well. Um, yeah, good. To having a bit of a day to relax today and actually do something for myself rather than work for once. So yeah, not too bad. Nice, nice. You got the whole weekend off, or have you been uh, to work weekends? Yeah, I, I I work pretty much most days. So yeah. yeah. Um. So um. So yeah. I, I I had to go into the into the studio and office today a little bit just to sort some bits out. But uh, and I don't I don't like a live thing that I normally do every Sunday. So yeah, I've done a little bit of work, but not not too much today. I actually managed to paint something for myself or start painting something <coughs> today. So yeah. So what do you what do you paint for yourself when you're not painting for others? Uh, mainly, uh, like mainly, well, it'll either be a blood angel or it'll be red. But uh, when, it, when it's not either of those things, uh, it will typically be something for work. So like one of our like new products or something that we're doing. Um, like we launched something called Custom Service a couple of about a month ago. Um, so we just I've got a couple of models that to sort of do for that as well. So yeah, so just it's, it's still work, but it's stuff that I've kind of I, I leave to the side to get done when I can, if that makes sense. So yeah. Nice, nice. Um, well, Tom, you're our uh, Blood Angels fanboy, aren't you? Yeah, I wouldn't say fanboy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, I, I, I collect Blood Angels. Um, I more go down the line of a successor chapter called the Sanguine Reapers, because I'm cool. Um, but no, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I will mix it up over the time I play. I will use the Blood Angels um, codex and all that, the supplement. And uh, occasionally shoot between them and the Sanguine Reapers, whatever benefits me, really, I suppose. It, who I'm going against. It's, it's all about those dice rolls. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine. Right, so should we kick us off with a few questions then? Yeah, sure. Yeah, great. go for it, mate. Or, or did you want to do sort of like an introduction to yourself and see each first? I can do. We... Yeah, that's fine. I'm more, more than happy to. Yeah. Like, um, so, so, yeah, so I, I, I got into the hobby like when I was, in, well, Going right back, my granddad got me into sort of kits and modeling from like the age of like five, six. So like right from the get go, um, I got into like airfix kits, um, that sort of Spitfires, all the Second World War stuff. He was an anti-aircraft gunner in London during the Second World War. So I grew up literally going to Bovington Tank Museum and Ducks for their base pretty much every other weekend, uh, month in, month out, like for my early, early years. Um, I don't think anybody else in the family was interested interested in the planes and stuff. So you had to take somebody and I kind of couldn't argue with it. So yeah, that's kind of what happened. Um, and then um, and then by the age of nine, like I, I was being looked after once one weekend by my nan and got taken to a into a charity shop and I found like this bag of, of, of second edition and like road trader plastic space marines just in like a lunch, lunch, like a lunch bag kind of thing. One of those things that you just you know, chuck your sandwiches in. Um, and the, the rest is pretty much history when it comes to how I got absolutely over the crazy mad addicted into 40k and space marines and, and, and that's and that's kind of where that came from but um but like painting I'd always I've always painted like I've always done some form of like creative outlet I, I was in music for a long time in bands so I, I done that like during the break that we all have from from painting and the hobby and warhammer and toy soldiers um and um and at the same time like uh I, you know my parents used to stick me in the back garden as a kid like with a long roll of blank wallpaper like just cheap MFI or like B&Q like wallpaper and I used to just literally just paint like with six colours on, on that so I've always painted um done airfix stuck the wings the wrong way around on those for a long time um uh, and then and then got into got into 40k and all hammer at the age of nine done it for up until I was like 20 21 um got into music done all bands and stuff blah blah, blah. um and then when I came back when that all kind of went to nothing after a long time um went back into the loft and all my Warhammer was there again. And then I continued. Um, I've always been into sort of like, uh, since I got back into it, I've always been into competition painting. That's kind of the thing that I'm super into. Um, and then like, um, and Siege kind of like was a, a side thing for me. Like when I was, I was in recruitment. So my role before 
doing Siege full time. Um, I was a recruitment consultant for about 11 years and um, and kind of like I got mucked around really badly in recruitment. Um, I worked for a local company here in Wakeford, um, worked there for three years and uh, they kind of pulled the rug under my feet. I lost my mortgage because of them changing my commission structure and Siege was already going at that time. And it was kind of a bit of a side hustle um, for me at the time. And um, and then, yeah, like when that happened, I just went, well, look, I've got 30 days holiday. I know what Siege is doing in and around, obviously, uh, 60 hour working week in recruitment. And um, and yeah, I just I just, you know, donned some speedos and goggles and jumped right in. You know, it's just uh, it's just that's kind of how it kind of how it it went from me going part time or doing it on the side thing to being full time um, before jumping a little bit back. And I'm dotting around a little bit. But before that, like um, I'd always been doing sort of like painting for my friends. Like when I was in sixth form, I'd paint my, their models and stuff for them and they'd buy me the odd paints and bits and bobs here. And it wasn't really a massive exchange for like cash for models back then. Like it was just like, oh, you painted this unit for me. Here's a paint set or here's those paints that you really wanted or, you know, blah, blah. Um, and uh, and yeah, like Siege was just this thing that like I started as like just me. 2013, I just started painting miniatures um, under the name Siege Studios with the, with the email address Siege Studios. Um, and then I got approached by Dave and Matt from any wargaming who, who just obviously had seen this. I had like a private personal YouTube channel where I just done like kit bash sort of diaries and like loads of blood angels. Cause I always used to paint loads and I still do. So, um, so, um, uh, and they approached me and said, look, would you like to paint some miniatures for us? And I was obviously using the, the CG email address at that time. I painted up some of their mini wargaming space marine chapter for them. Um, and then like once I sent it off, like two weeks later, like, um i i woke up with like 1500 emails one weekend when i was up at a warhammer world battle brothers tournament with one of my mates my phone was going crazy like it was just vibrating and pinging and i, had to, I remember physically had to put it on silent because it was going so nuts and um what happened is they'd put up a video of what i would painted for them and in the description of the video they put if you want anything painted by night like siege blah, blah blah click on this link well my inbox was just was crazy it's like the most humbling thing ever um so around the same time as that, I was doing competition circuit, like painting like for Golden Demon, some of the, the, the different things, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and I just said to a couple of my mates, look, I, this has happened. I need help because I want to do something with this. And, um, and that's kind of like where Siege started. So I know I've been rattling on chewing your ears off now, so I don't want to bore you. But um, that's kind of like a bit about me, how Siege started. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's that. Nice. That's a really interesting story how it, how it sort of worked out and you were sort of pushed into it and then with a bit of luck then yeah. <laughs> you are where you are where you are today so yeah it's not been easy in the slightest like um you know uh it's it's eight years on nearly nine years on from that like in February next year will be nine years and um you know like uh, I'm surprised I'm I'm not you know I'm not completely bought or white or, or white haired or grey haired because it's been it's been um you know uh, it's been, it's been a lot, a lot of work, you know, being frank. So, so yeah. So just for, just for people out there who obviously aren't completely aware of what Siege do, what is it that um, you guys actually do? So, so we're a full full service commission painting studio. Um, so um, the, there's 52 painters on, or 54 painters now on the painting team that work for Siege. Um, and there's nearly 10 staff in the office, including myself. Um, we are a professional, registered, fully trading VAT paying business. We're not, and I, there's no disrespect to people who do it on, on the side or whatever, blah, blah, blah. We're not a couple of guys in a shed. We are a professional business with offices, studios, people who work in the office. Like, uh, you know, that is what we are as a company. Um, of the team of 54 painters, all of them are high end painters. Like, Siege does not paint anything to a uh, to what's considered tabletop obviously tabletop is very wish-washy some people's tabletop is very different from other people's we don't paint to that standard we paint for to uh, an, an above tabletop as a minimum like our bronze level is a premium gaming that is a a very very good gaming gaming quality if that makes sense um and then we go through obviously all our levels so silver gold and platinum um at the top end of the, of the spectrum so platinum uh, the senior team here at Siege, there's 20 of this, or just shy of 20 of the senior team. Uh, and all of those are competition winners, finalists, and ex heavy metal. So we've got four members of every metal that work for the company, plus a number of Games Workshop army painting team, ex army painting team that work for the company. Um, a couple of painters that used to work for different uh, miniature manufacturers in the industry also. So we've got a senior team. And when I say junior team, I don't mean it in a, in a negative way because the junior team, they, they're not junior in any way, shape or form. All of them as a minimum have between 10 to 12 to 15 years experience each. 
it's just we split the team between acc accoladed and professionally accoladed and painters that are just extremely competent, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's what we do. We offer, obviously, four, four levels here at Siege. And they're all super high level. Um, and it, with the super high level that you get both in what gets painted, uh, the quality of service that you get from the business as well is of a premium nature. We are a professional premium business. Like I've always tried to do things from my recruitment background as regulated, as professional, as physically possible. That's 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 what Siege is. And uh, I suppose the modus operandi, that's what we are as a company. That's awesome. I mean, we've obviously, us, we've only been in it, a few of us, for maybe 12 months uh, since we started at the beginning of lockdown. But um, Siege is definitely someone that comes to our attention straight away. So it's obviously getting out there. You're obviously doing a good job. Well, thank you um, very much. <laughs> that's it. Um, so, yeah, we, I suppose now we'll just go around in a circle and ask you a few questions from our, yeah. each of us. Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, obviously, do you play Warhammer uh, or do you prefer painting it or is it everything for you? You're just sort of Warhammer crazy. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably one of the most passionate people in this industry you're going to find when it comes to all aspects of it like I, I'm super into it like I always have been um like for me like due to some personal circumstances in my life like uh like time is the most important commodity for me like without trying to get too deep and too sort of crazy into it but like um I value that over many other things like so I don't watch like Netflix series or I don't watch like uh, tv uh, that much at all or play computer games because uh, like the investment of time into that like you don't have much tangibility for that if that makes sense so like yeah. what you get what you get in return isn't really i know some people use like computer games as an escape mechanism and like to just turn off and switch off but i get the same from painting miniatures and the thing is at the end of it like once you've like physically painted something or you've done something like you, you have something in hand that you're forever more going to have unless it catches fire gets stolen or you lose it so or, or sell it obviously um so in a long-winded answer I, I i love painting uh it's probably top of the list if i was to put it in a list um gaming as well i do like a lot like i've got a gaming katachan army that i'm super into i'm trying to get it done by the end of the year uh or, or i say end of the year but sort of like september time um uh but the gaming side of it even though yes it is something physical and tangible because your models are on the table and you have lots of memories obviously of the games you play i don't as i'm getting older and as i'm investing more time into painting i i probably will probably step away from gaming a little bit as i probably get older because as I as I'm as I'm experiencing it and doing it, I'm kind of seeing it the same as as computer games. To be perfectly honest, yes, you'll remember that game for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks down the line, and you might remember that odd dice roll that you made a crazy save or a crazy charge or whatever, blah blah. blah. But past that, you don't really have anything physical for that investment of time, if that makes sense. So for me, in a long-winded answer again, sorry to chew your ears off. Like um, painting is the top of the list for me, and then. I'd say gaming is a close second, um, but I love all the other things. So like converting, kit bashing. Um, I love the narrative and background. I love all the books, I, I, you know, all those kind of things like but The gaming side of it still interests me and it's great. I used to do it loads when I was younger, but it's it's probably second place to painting now as I get older. So, so yeah, sorry about the long answer. No, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, like, like, I agree. Like when you get that model at the end of, you know, um, completing it and you look at it, you do feel that satisfaction, don't you? And you know, it's going to be there on your shelf and, Whenever you want to look at it, it's there. Talk to that, exactly. Yeah, it's that, that's the thing. Like, unless someone steals it, you, you're always going to have it. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. On 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 models. Um, one thing I, I'm curious about is what would what's been your. I suppose it might be tough to answer, but what's maybe what's your current favourite model that you've painted yourself? And then the other side of the question, what's probably been your favourite commission? Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to, let's do, let's do my favorite model first. Cause if I don't say it now, I'm going to be wanting to say it for the rest of the time we speak. <laughs> um, so, so we recently uh, launched um, custom service and this isn't me trying to sell it or anything. It's, it's basically our, our, our top end service, which is we've got a traditional sculpting team that create uh, one off unique certified models. You get a certificate, blah, blah. So to launch custom service, um, I wanted to create some models which uh, for my personal collection, which I have always wanted. I've never been able to get the models in necessarily the old versions or whatever. And I wanted them in certain poses and ways that I wanted them. So as probably the biggest Blood Angels fanboy on the planet, like I, I, I had to get a Primaris Dante that actually gave him. I know he hasn't been he hasn't passed the Rubicon yet, but for me, I wanted to have that. I've seen loads of people do conversions of it. We used storm casts and all these kind of things. And I wanted him looking 
as he should do. And I've got a bit of artwork in the office uh, behind, by my desk, like of, of this pose where he's like landing um, on this rock. It's, it's from the Dante artwork, like from the, from the book. So what I wanted to do is create the next scene in that pose or in that artwork where he's landed, he's turned and he's facing the next adversary, basically. So uh, as for custom service, we made uh, Ben, the sculpt, one of the sculpting team here at Siege, basically made the exact pose of him landed on that rock from that artwork and turned with the axe mortalis to bear at the front of him and like the, the pistol in like a guarded pose. For the moment I saw it, because he kept it super secret, he was like, I'm not going to show you until it's finished, until it's done. And literally, like, the moment I got the, the images of the, the converted and green stuff model, I, I, I fell in love with it. Like, um, and yeah, like, painting it was, uh, was a, a massive project for me. It took months because I wanted to get it exactly right and be an honour, the original model and the artwork at the same time. Like, I'm very much, I will try and paint. So if I do something, I'll try and paint it like the artwork, if that makes sense, because I want to put as much... A lot of people don't invest in the painting of their miniatures this rich narrative they just paint them as the colors they should be and don't think oh well they're ultramarine so they should have this or they might have this or they're blood angels they will have this where so i think when you're painting something narrative as well as the color scheme as well as the actual details on the model is super important um and uh, and yeah so in long-winded answer the prime iris dante from custom service is my favorite model we've i've ever painted uh, like and it's a that's a very difficult call because there's plenty of love angels at the office that I could say so so yeah um so that uh, as for commission like I can either give you a really funny one or I can give you something that I just absolutely love so I'm going to let you choose because there's two that come to mind straight away gotta hear both you give both okay oh, yeah right. gotta hear both. <laughs> all right yeah. okay cool so um let's start with a funny one so um we've there's various videos on our YouTube channel of this absolutely like we've done some bonkers commissions over the time we've had like um We've had like uh, a recently a Primaris captain that was themed after Severus Snape dressed in Neville Longbottom's grandmother's clothing. Um, that, that that was that was the picture and, and the reference. It was just that photo. Um, like um, and then we've had like angry Marines, goth Celestines. But the one that really takes the biscuit for being like the most out there bonkers project was actually a uh, multiple phases of an army that was themed after Bacon. All right, so uh, and I'm being deadly serious when I say this. All right, okay. So we got a project in. The client obviously said that, yeah, I want to go ahead with it. Obviously, a project we quoted for. We send out a specification form to be completed. It's really strict, has all the sections and everything that needs to be completed. And um, and I waited for the spec to come back. So a day or so passed, and then the spec came back. So obviously, we we basically quality control the spec against what the clients paid for. So we know exactly what you know they can have, they can't have, blah blah blah. And it's broken down into sections. So you're building, you're cleaning, you're painting, you're basing, extras, so on and so forth. And literally in the building and cleaning, the spec was, um, I'd like this army to be themed after bacon. Please, please see my reference images below. Nothing in painting, nothing in basting, nothing in extras. And then it just had like a picture of a pig, um, some rashes of bacon in a packet, uh, some of them in a frying pan. <laughs> And and then just and then just like a picture of him that he'd taken in the supermarket, for, perhaps for comedic effect, of him with a thumb his thumbs up next to the packet in the supermarket. So that that was you know that was the spec. So anyway, long story short, we I gave this to Ben, one of the painting team here, and he just absolutely like annihilated it. He literally painted it the Marines, the armor like a maroon color. The trim was like this like almost ivory like de desaturated ivory kind of like fat color. All the purity seals were like. The, the seal round bit was the tomato and then the bits hanging down were actual rashes of bacon where he painted the marbling effect on it. Um, there was a sergeant with like a squeegee bottle of ketchup and a bacon butty. Like the tanks had like the chapter symbol was like a bacon butty like with ketchup coming out of it. Like it was just, it's crazy. So we've done this army, sent it off. And then, and then the guy came back and went, this is amazing, blah, blah, blah. I've just received it. I want to do more. And we were like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like, <laughs> so it, it ended up being like three or four phases of like bacon space Marines and like, it, yeah, that, that forever, like forever, it's going to be the most ludicrous thing we've ever done. Um, so that's the funniest one we've done. Um, I, for, for like the, my favorite, it's being honest, it's very difficult to pick specifically one because I get, I'm very humbled and honored to be able to see so many awesome mo models on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. Um, but I would probably say, like, for me, like, one of the team painted uh, uh, an alternate colour schemes Nurgle Army. And we had, we've got this incredible Mortarian that's, like, this teal bluish colour that um, with, like, black armour. And, like, the wings are, like, a blue. Like, the, all the Terminators, like, the Nurgle Terminators, the Light Lord Terminators and the, and the Nurgle Marine, the Plague Marines, they're all in, like, a black armour. 
they just look really menacing, even more menacing than you'd expect from Nurgle. And um, yeah, for me, it's probably one of my favourites. I think we've done over the last eight years since we since we started as a business. It's just um, again, it's it's so hard to choose, being frank. But if one comes to mind, just for how sort of how much it stands out, I'd probably say that that sort of alternate custom skin Nurgle army is probably one of my favourites. Awesome. Yeah, very nice. So when when you get um, a commission come in, do you pick? where the commission goes, who, who gets that job. Um, and yeah. then are there any ones that you think, actually, I'll, I'm going to keep this one because it's, it's awesome. Yeah, it's it's a hard one. Like, um, as as things obviously have got busier and busier over the last sort of like, uh, especially, especially over the last two or three years with the industry getting so, so crazy, crazy as it is. Um, and that's obviously due to various things. Um, I, I took my hand off the tool, so to speak, about three or four years ago with Siege because obviously the rate, the rate of growth that we have, you know, again, extremely humbled by it. But the but the reality is, is that, yeah, there are things that come in. I'm like, oh, I'd love to paint that. I'd love to do that. I, I say with an elder and old friend here that I'm, I'm going to do for a client. But, there, the, the, but I don't really paint much for the business unless it's like a special project, like cut something for custom service to, to launch a part of the brand and the business. Um we're 54 painters in the company now. Obviously, we you know we have a lot of painting team um, uh, that work for the business, and uh, there are other projects that I just like. Yeah, I'd love to do it, but I, I, I've got to kind of I've got to take my hand away from it because otherwise, I, the things that I need to do, I get tied up by you know by FOMO of painting some commission that comes in that I absolutely love. Um, as for allocation, like uh, obviously, all the team have a pipeline that we manage in office that obviously we allocate projects and it's on a case by case basis as, as first and foremost as when they come in. And secondly, as well, um, by look, we try I, as, as a painter, I, one thing I'd say with Siege and again, just not trying to go on a tangent because I know you guys don't want to listen to me rattle on for a decade. But the reality is, is that like um, I am not, not I hate I, from all my years in recruitment, I hate bosses i'm not a big fan of, of the boss culture where it's like the person running the business has no clue about what's actually involved with the job like categorically i've done every low down dirty job within siege that i'd expect any of the team to do so the way i am is more of a leader as opposed to, to a boss in the company if that makes sense obviously that hat as the owner does have to go on when those circumstances arise but for the rest of the time i'm i'm the right hand man there to help you constantly that's the person i am um so with that being said what we try and do is if we, we, we do like it. We've got like an internal thing that we're doing uh, really soon, which is like an internal team member questionnaire. And if we can allocate stuff that you prefer as a painter, we'll obviously try and do that. But the reality is, is with commission painting, uh, I can talk a lot about the industry because I've done it for a very long time and, and to the level that we do. But uh, it's, it's like the Wild West. You, you're going to get jobs that you're not going to like and you're going to get jobs that you never want to give back. And from that point to that point, you have to do everything with all, within that. There's, there, you know, so we try and be as fair as possible to the team. We try and allocate stuff that we know that they're going to like. Um, but obviously, sometimes there are jobs like Mr. Blobby Marines or whatever you want to call it that that you're just not going to ha- enjoy. Possibly, I don't know. You might do. I don't know. But but the reality is, is that you know um, that you, there's every type of job in in the, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. If that makes sense. On that as well. So say you get a big commission come in. Do you have multiple painters working on the same commission, or is it always one person will do the whole lot? No, that's see, that's 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 something that Siege is not about. Being frank, like, and I'm not scared to say this, like, um, Siege is not about speed. Like, that's the one thing that I want to make categorically clear. Obviously, we try and turn it around in as quick as possible for the client and for our clients. However, um, unlike again, remaining as professional, <clears throat> professional as possible, unlike companies that you may have, you may know of, like. Um, we don't do what's called battery henning. Okay. So it won't be five, six people touching one project categorically not. That's one of the key things with us at Siege. Like um, whether it's one space marine or 5,000 termigants. Yeah. It would be one painter that does everything, which in the case of the termigants is quite scary to be perfectly honest. But the reality is, is that what that gives you is consistency from miniature to miniature in a battery hen process. Um, it only takes someone's dog to die or their girlfriend to leave them or their partner to leave them or something to happen in their life. And one link in that chain is not working efficiently, if that makes sense. And that's where inconsistency is is bred. And that's where a lack of care is bred, if that makes sense. Um, With us, categorically, one person does everything, no matter the size of it, because then that way you have that single person's attention on that project all the way through. Um, You know, it's, it's a, it's, 
we are not the fastest service. I'm not scared to say it, but what you will get is second to nobody. And I can assure you of that. So, so yeah, so that's basically, hopefully that answers your question. On, 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 I suppose on the topic of speed, you say, obviously you say you're not the fastest um, service, but for some of us, painting is, um, is, is probably not our favoured uh, part of the hobby. Um, <laughs> and sometimes it can be a challenge to, to get into it and get stuff done, whether that's like for me, it's batch painting. I, I can't stand batch painting. I know Glenn, for example, sometimes struggles with the motivation. Like it, it can take me, for example, weeks and weeks and weeks just to get, you know, five Marines knocked out. What, when we say speed, what type of speed are we talking with, with you guys? Um, like, so building and cleaning is one part of it. Painting is another, basing is another, uh, like additional services are sculpting freehand, magnetizing, the painting of the magnetized parts, all of that. Like I, you should, if you're just on a slight tangent before I answer it directly. So like, what we as a business it's and when it comes to the painting like it's better to teach yourself to be accurate neat and sharp than just whack it on as quick as you can without the, the due care of that mm -hmm. because if you if you master being neat sharp and, and practice your brush control muscle memory in your hand the speed will come if that makes sense all right and that's combining it with various different ways of painting like most people being frank paint a bit like a butterfly they'll go oh i'm going to paint this bit gold i'm going to change the silver i'm going to paint this bit silver oh now i'm going to paint this bit black i'm now going to paint this bit red so what we teach and part of the training process in siege like and i say training not in a in a, in a sort of way that, that people come to us and they don't know how to paint because they do but a lot of people paint in a very un time efficient and again going back to me being super time orientated like it, we teach to paint by color so what i mean by that is you put the majority color on so let's just take my fanboyism so you take blood angels, you paint them red. Yeah. You then take the next majority color, which is black or, or if that, which typically would be, if you're being proper OG and doing the trims black, like you should do if you're a true blood angels player, um, <laughs> you, you, you will, you will, you, you'll put the black on and put the black in all the places. Then you'll go to the next one, which is typically silver. Then you'll go to the next one, not focusing on the detail because if you purely focus on the color, you're going to work through it and paint everything on that model that needs that color. And then once that's done, that color gets the hell out of your life and you pick the next color. And the beauty of it is then you're reducing by the amount on, by the amount you need to paint on that model. So when it gets to the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth color, it's hardly anything to put on the miniature and the model <coughs> looks basically like it's done. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So now you understand that kind of culture and method and uh, almost like it's like a car production line if that works. When the car goes down the conveyor belt, they put the four seats in, they put the four doors on, they put the four wheels on. It's working by the action or the color as opposed to, oh, I'm just going to put this button on the dash and then I'm going to put the tail light on and then I'm going to put the front light. That, that a lot of people paint in that manner and it's massively time. You're wasting the single commodity you don't have more on, which is that time aspect of it. All right. OK, so with all that being said, Generally speaking, you should be able to paint 10 Marines to our bronze level within a day to a day and a half. It, that's, that's the speed that you need to be painting at, basically. So that should, that should give you a bit of an idea. I could only dream of living in a world where I can do 10 Marines in a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not for everybody, being frank. But, but, like, but once you get, that, once you get that, that mindset and that approach to painting, it's, a ma it's more arduous factually because when you get to the 10th model and you're doing black, it's like, please, someone put a spear through my face. Like, you know, <laughs> but, but, but the reality is, is that like, once you're ingrained in that way of painting, it, it, it does make you more methodical and more, and more regimented, if that makes sense. Like, you know, so it is a business. It's not, you know, I, I wouldn't paint 500 termigants for a hobby. I, that's why I never, that's why I never do a, a tyranny army, being frank. But, um, but yeah, so hopefully, again, sorry to be so long with you, but I'd rather give you a fully black and white, transparent, direct answer. That's, that's the minimum expectation. No, it's, it's, it's all good. Um, and I was going to say on, on, I'm sorry, guys, I'm, I'm monopolizing questions here, but on the, uh, <laughs> on the color side of things, what, what do you think is the most difficult color to paint and why is it yellow? Uh, yeah. So, so I hear this all the time, like whites yeah. and yellow, yellows and like, and things like that. Like, um, but generally speaking, <clears throat> like uh, we, we use an airbrush for, I'd say probably 10 to 15% of the process. Um, and one of the biggest sticklers we're painting those specific colors that you mentioned and, and, and I chucked in the hat as well, like um, is the fact of getting them on smooth with the brush. Now, yellows and uh, oranges, you don't see a lot of orange armies either. Like, you know, um, the, the, the typically they are harder colors to put on because they haven't got such dense pigmentation unless you're using like Avalon Sunset or something like that, or maybe some of the more uh, dense pigment 
uh, ranges like model color or things like that. Um, but generally speaking, like uh, it's because they're just harder to put a smooth, consistent layer on. Now the airbrush does that for us. And again, going back to what I always am passionate about, which is time. If it gives you better quality and saves you time, it's a no brainer to use it. I never, I'm a, I never advocate quicker, but worse quality. If it's, if it's worse quality and it's quicker, it goes out the door with any, all the rest of the rubbish. Like, so, so if you can get the pigmentation and, and, and the dilution of the paint correct uh, and do it with a brush, which is more than possible, you can easily get those colors on. It's just learning and mastering that dilution and pigment management when you're moving it on the surface of the model. Um, if you haven't got that ability and skill because you haven't practiced it or you know uh, you don't know what to do, for example, an airbrush does that work, helps you with that and almost gives you a set of crutches or stabilizers to be able mm -hmm. to do that better, if that makes sense. Um, for me, um, I'd probably say one of my one of my colors which I don't really uh, I don't really like too much to paint, um, and it's probably something that I'm going to be spending some time to invest into to get better at. It would probably be like as I said, oranges or purples, because typically in most paint ranges you don't have a wide stretch of tones and hues within those ranges, so your purples and oranges and things like that. Um, so they tend to be a bit harder to actually sort of get a lot of tonal variation and the highlight stages and the shading and all that blah 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 so, so that's personally what i'd say but yeah generally speaking an airbrush does a lot of the work it's very good up until that 10 15 percent mark and then when everything else is done this is then what takes over and this is 80 percent, 80 to 85 percent of painting miniatures in my in my opinion again there are in our industry as in commission painting there are people that rely heavily on an airbrush there are people that rely purely on brushes there are i i think a good balance is 10 to 15 percent airbrush 80 to 85 paint brushes. That's, that's kind of what I would look at it, if that makes sense. Cool. So sort of on that. Um, going on from... Go on, Dave. If you, no, you go, Dave. I've, you go. I've lost a couple. <laughs> no, you go, mate. <laughs> so you say, obviously, with quality, again, with paints, do you decide what paints you're going to use? Or is that, again, painter by painter basis? They can choose what works best for them or... And what paints and brushes do you so, use? So uh, just right off the get-go, I have to be completely transparent. So like there's no sort of like attempted plug or anything like that. So my other business is Artis Opus. That's my other company. I'm one of the three directors and owners of Artis Opus. Um, so I use obviously Artis Opus brushes, um, obviously because it's my business, uh, but I have used in the past all the others that you probably know. So obviously your Wins and Newtons, your Raphael's, your, all those brushes, I've used those. And again, I'm never going to ram my product down people's throats. I'd rather just be like, try brushes, whichever you prefer, use them. All right. So again, I use them because I'm one of the owners and it's my, it's my business. Um, but all those other ones I mentioned will do the exact same job if you just prefer that, 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 that brush and the handle and the way that the head behaves. Um, regarding paint ranges, um, I would probably say that like for me personally as a painter, and I'll always say uh, this purely as an opinionated thing, it's not really factual because Number one, we have clients that say, I want exactly this color scheme with these paints. And we have to follow that like a, like a, like a skeleton or a recipe, which is fine. Um, but generally speaking, I think as a business, I'd probably say a good 60 to 70% of the team will use the holy trinity of Citadel, Vallejo and Scale 75, typically. Um, they're kind of like the three go-to brands that we've probably got the most experience and use of, if that makes sense. Um, I'm a bit of a, even though I'm only 35, Four and thirty-five in a couple of months, but like only I, I'm very much I'm very much of the old ilk and mind. I love the old Games Workshop ranges. So your hex bottles, your black lids, and your bolter shell ones, which were the ones just is the paint range before the range we've got currently. If that makes sense, like I am a blood red hoarder. I have more bottles of blood red than you could possibly imagine. And when they got rid of the range, I went around every single Games Workshop in about a thirty-mile radius and bought up every single one. So, <laughs> so, um, so like. I use a lot of older paints because I prefer them typically. Um, uh, but yeah, the Holy Trinity of Scale, Vallejo and, and Citadel are probably the core ones that we use. We have some clients that like Army Painter. We have some clients that like P3. We have some clients that like Coat de Arms. And we do use them. It's just, I'd say 60 to 70% of the ranges that we use to tend to be the Holy Trinity of those three, typically, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we're just wondering what was your first commission and how did it go when you very first started you got your first one up and you was like right let's set this, these wheels in motion this is uh this is really really testing my memory now because it was many many years ago um, <laughs> but um but i would probably say i think all right so i back in the day obviously the mini war game space spring chapter was one that we that, that i done um you know and um 
Uh, but on top of that, there was a corn berserker army, which I did. So I've done some corn berserkers. Um, what else was there? God, there's some raven wings. There's a raven wing back in the day that we've done. Uh, obviously, your grey knights, because they, I think they were super popular back then, about eight years ago or so when they first came out. I think it's about eight years ago where they upgraded the range or something. I think that's it when it was. Um, but yeah, that, they're some of the earliest ones which which uh, which I've done when it was just me. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's a very 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 long time ago. But um, and again, a, a good one of those at least was painted with the best color out there. So you know, it's uh, so so yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> so touching on that, what would you suggest to people who want to start commission work? I mean, obviously you've said the way that um, Siege goes about things very methodical in, in the yeah. way that you do things. Is that just what you would, you would teach someone who wanted to start it off for the first time, who thought they had it in them? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I wouldn't be sitting here now, like, uh, unless I said, like, okay, well, we're, like, I'm going to put it out there. I'm a, I'm a business owner at the end of the day. Like, I'm always, always looking for painters to join the company, if provided they can paint to the quality and to the standard. So if anyone's watching or listening that, that you know, would like to apply, then it's info at seedstudios.co.uk. Send CV, portfolio and bio. Um but if you're looking to start out, like I, I started doing stuff for friends, okay, um, and uh, when in the early, early days, like like before Siege, when I was just literally doing stuff for people in, in when I was in sixth form and when I was just, you know, that, that kind of time. Um, but generally speaking, like you're, you're probably your friends and like your, your close circle of, of gaming friends from your local club or GW, you're probably going to be your first clients and the people that you would, that you would um, sort of get work from, so to speak. Um, and like being transparent like as i mentioned earlier and touched upon earlier like the the industry is very much like the wild west and it's super close to my heart and hopefully i'm coming across as passionate as i always do but the reality is is that when i say the wild west what i mean by that is this a lot of people will disagree with what i'm about to say next but when i break it down and explain it there is no factual difference other than a piece of paper so i see miniature painting as a skilled trade all right it is it's a physical action of doing something with knowledge and experience and experience is the only time invested over many years to get as good as you are if that makes sense there's no difference from that when it's a carpenter a plumber electrician a bricky or anyone like that it's no different other than they've gone to college and got a certificate to say i can wire a circuit or i can do some plumbing or i can do this you still have to learn how to do it right and there's no difference with that when it comes to painting miniatures because you're getting to a good point is your training so to speak if that makes sense yeah so a lot of people disagree with that because obviously this whole entire thing has come from being a hobby and unfortunately because it is branded with that word a lot of people devalue it yeah a lot of people devalue it and this is where when you are painting for your friends and for people in your local gaming groups and things like that they are not going to pay you what quite frankly your time is worth all right. They are not just factual. No matter how you try and string it, they will not pay you what you're worth. All right. OK. And this is why so many people, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's a combination of, again, hobbyists attempting to run businesses, which is nothing wrong with that. If you want it, it's just a little side earner or some extra money here and there or to pay for your hobby or to pay for your miniatures or to pay for your things. But doing it as a VAT, limited company in the industry, and doing it from your bedroom uh, or from your shed for just a little bit of extra money, they are very far far apart, if that makes sense. Like, I, being frank, like, I, as, as the owner of the company that I own, like, I wouldn't be sitting here if I, I didn't do it in a way which separated what Siege does from that, if that makes sense. Yeah, we are not that kind of company. And I would like to think that people come to us because they understand that we are a professional business. Like, um, but going back to it, we have we are conventions and when I talk to people and people ask me, oh, so how much would this be? And you tell them the price or you tell them the, the hourly investment or the time that's involved with it, if that makes sense. And they're like, oh, my God, I didn't I no way would I do that or no way would I pay that. And the reality is, is that when you flip it and you say to them, OK, so you you work in your job, you know, what's your what's your day rate or what's your hourly rate, whatever. Well, this unit has taken me this much time. So as a result of that, this is how much it costs. And then when you explain it that way and break it down that way, people are like, oh, right. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. But the thing is, instantaneously, because commission painting is tarnished with it's a hobby, it's for fun, it's come from, oh, I just do this for a laugh, people don't value it. And then when you take that commodity, which we don't physically realise and see, like it's not something physical or tangible in your hand that you see time, again, people don't value it. So what I would say to anybody starting out is to, when you first start out, do stuff for your friends. And whether you're, if you want to give your time to somebody that you're not going to get back, then that's perfectly fine. But don't get 
annoyed and alienated when someone doesn't value that because initially at those early points they will not value it you know and you have to be aware of that what i call it is the slog it's the, to, to get again eight years down the line nearly nine years down the line siege is where it's at that journey has not been easy i can guarantee you i've had every difficult situation, every arduous conversation, everything you could possibly imagine. I've been through it. I've bought the t-shirt. I've got the trainers. I've got the hat. I've done it. All right. Okay. And this is why when it comes to us recruiting as a company, and I'm not trying to angle this or turn this into like a recruitment drive, but the reality is, is that the way we do things at Siege and when people come on board with us and join the business as a painter, all the rubbish that I've had to slog through for eight years, you don't have to deal with. All you do is you paint the models to our standards or to our expectations and to what our client wants and you get paid for doing it. So if you're looking to start out and do it for yourself, get paint stuff for your mates, paint stuff for local game groups. Don't expect massive things in return unless that person actually values your time and values your experience and wants to pay you that because they won't because they don't see you as a business. All right. Um, or if you don't want to deal with any of that and not get valued, drop me an email. So it's, uh, it's, 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 that's what I would say. <laughs> Epic answer. And also, yeah. don't worry, your passion is 100% coming across. Yeah, I'm glad. Awesome. I'm glad. Yeah, I've got a question. I know I've been sitting here quite silently the entire time. Um, I used to work for GW, so I'm quite familiar with the, this is my hobby and this is my job. How do you and your guys deal with basically hobby burnout? That's a very, very good one. Um, so like all the guys at Siege, like we, that's, that's why we try and basically uh, rotate things so that people don't get the same thing again and again and again. We try and obviously make it so that they get stuff that they might enjoy. Um, but at the same time, like hobby burnout, I say hobby burnout, a painting burnout, whatever the case, it's going to hit like it happens. Like I'm not, I can't sit here. I'll always be honest and be transparent. That's how I am. Like, um, it happens. And when it does, what I would say is you do a massive reset. And what I mean by that is like, for me, whether you want to practice to get better as a painter or whether you want to uh, just step away from the thing that you've been painting for so long, I recommend picking the thing that's furthest from your comfort zone. So for me, as a painter of more red and blood angels than you can imagine, I will go to the far extreme of that and I'll pick something so far removed from what I'm accustomed to that actually gives me an almost clean slate to start painting on, if that makes sense. So I love Age of Sigmar miniatures. I absolutely love them. I don't play the game. I don't I don't really buy into the narrative too much. It's okay. It's good. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I was never really into fantasy when I first went in Games Workshop. I was like eight foot tall, bolter wielding space marines uh, in the future or Knights of the Round Table. I was like, give me the space marines all day long. Um, the reality is, is that like um, I would pick something so far removed and almost use it as an experiment to practice things. Like if you haven't painted with lots of greens or if you haven't painted with lots of pinks or if you haven't painted with lots of oranges or you've never painted a model in that color way, pick a model that you'd probably never ever paint and with attach colors to it that you'd probably never ever use that often and then try and create something whilst combining that with, I must paint the neatest, sharpest, best I can. When you combine those three things, you will, two things will happen number one you learn a lot of things about the miniature about the different types of paints that you're using and most importantly because you're out so far removed from your comfort zone like uh just on a side note when people come in our painting classes one of the first things i try and instill is the mindset of and i'm not going to obviously use, use the profanity to shock that i normally do but what i normally say is your comfort zone is your enemy and you can guess what i fill in with that all right okay the reality is is that your comfort zone is your enemy. Like if you paint Iron Warriors day in, day out for eight years or for six years, you're going to love painting silver and you're going to know how to paint it, shade it, highlight it, do all those things. But if I turn around to you and say, I want you to paint me an orange like power armored space marine, you're going to go, uh, what do I do? That, uh, what do I do is where you learn. And it's like anything like, um, you know, uh, uh, again, not trying to be too deep, but like as humans, when you're put in an adverse situation, a fight or flight, and it's not like someone's holding a gun to your head and going to kill you. But when you're put in that situation where it's like, I need to learn this and do the best I can. And I'm trying to paint it the best I can using a model I've never painted before. And also colors that I've not very used before. You're always going to grow. You're not going to die. Nothing's going to go wrong. And the worst thing you're going to make a mistake on the model where it's not going to look the best because you made, put it on too thick or you didn't learn that paint well enough, or you didn't dilute it down enough, or you didn't layer it smooth enough. It's not the end of the world. That's what bio strip 20 is for. You can strip the model and start again. So like, that's the way that I would approach it. If you get that hobby burnout, pick something so far removed from your comfort zone 
with colors that you've never used to paint that much or that often at all combine those and also with the mindset of i've got to paint the sharpest neatest smoothest best i can almost treat it like you're doing a painting competition yeah like when i paint for competition my focus my attention my 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 what i want to do is so far higher from i'm just painting this for my eye my army that all of that together will give you the biggest gains in painting you've ever ever experienced than just painting the same thing that you do day in day out because it's what you love and what you cherish so so yeah hopefully that that answers that question for you yeah definitely cool <clears throat> so going on from that um you say you mentioned there you uh do sometimes into competitions which competitions do you enter and i'll have to ask have you won any so, uh, so yeah, like I, look, I, look, I, I've been very busy over the last eight years with, with Siege and with obviously Art and Sofas and some other bits and bobs that I do. Um, but um, yeah, like comp the reason I love competition is because I'm super passionate about people progressing their painting and pushing yourself as, as a painter, if that makes sense. Um, so I've entered Golden Demon a few, a few times. Uh, I've, I've done fairly well. Like I've, I've got quite a few different finalists, a couple of commended, and I've, I won a Demon back in 2018 um, awesome. for, for a duel that I'd done. Um, uh, and then um, I don't know whereabouts exactly in the country you all are, but there's obviously Salute, so Salute uh, Convention in London. So um, back in 2018, I think it was 2018, yeah, it was 2018. I won gold in squad. So I, I've got my Blood Angel squad, one of my favorite things I've ever painted. I got gold at that. Um, and then this one's a bit of a, I say biased, it's not because there wasn't any brown paper bags. So in 2020, uh, we, Siege was the only company to have, we, we launched uh, our, our own painting competition in London called Iron Skull. So Iron Skull is a, is a branded painting competition um, that, you can, uh, that you can enter and it's for all different levels of painters. It's designed totally to, to, to push you as a painter, to make you step up, to make yourself obviously try and achieve better. And obviously there's staff category. So staff cat, uh, what we do internally in the company is say like, it has to be like a character. So for example, like a 28 mil character, or whatever, blah, blah. Um, and nobody in the company is allowed to talk to each other about their entries. So on the day, everyone brings their entries and it's like, wow, this is what I've done. And then we have a massive talking point about, oh my God, you've done that, blah, 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 blah. So um, obviously, if it's a painting competition, I'm going to enter. But obviously as the owner of the company, like I, uh, it's a bit of a position where it's like, so what it basically is, is that, so a couple of my good friends, so Andy Wardle, Richard Gray and John Keyes were the judges of, um, of, of, uh, of Iron Skull in 2020. Um, and obviously all the entries went in the cabinet and there were no name plaques or anything like that. So no one knew what, whose entry was it. So that's where my entry went in and it was on the same level as everybody's because no one knew whose entries was what. So the judges, obviously. Um, so obviously the judging happens uh, and I got like a, I came third in staff cat. Like, so I won a bronze in staff cat, but I, I can promise you there was no brown paper bags or anything at all. So <laughs> it, was literally, it was literally like, yeah, so I've, I've won a few things, but to be perfectly honest, like, um, I don't really look for the glory of the trophy. Like I enter because I want to enter and to use it as a, as a trampoline to push myself harder and harder and harder when it comes to painting. If I get finalist or if I get a trophy, obviously taking a trophy home is a great thing. Don't get me wrong. And it's nice to have it on the shelf. Um, but I see the real reward as the effort and learning that went into achieve that as opposed to look at me, I've got a trophy. I like, it's nice having a trophy. Don't get me wrong. But the process of achieving it is what is of more value because that spurs me on for everything else that I'm going to do past that point, if that makes sense. Um, that's why I believe that competitions and that's why Siege runs its own competition because I want to give back as best I can. And I want to give an arena where it's about more about let's do this to improve my painting. And if I win something, that's great, but it's the experience and pushing yourself that's more, more important if you get me. So, yeah. So, uh, so hopefully that answers that question for you guys. Yeah, so I, guys, I disagree with that. I've won a trophy. Here we go. We've never I've won, won, won before. Go on, go on, Glenn. Go on. <laughs> yeah, no. I just thought I'd bring that up again, you know. That's it's not been it. mentioned in a couple of Blue episodes. Blue Water Painting so. Champion, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's good. The last <laughs> and so, current reigning because, you know, stores yeah. out there anymore, so. Yeah, yeah you, no, you can no. have the um, Blue Water Current Reigning Champion, but he, he doesn't paint 10 Marines a day. He paints 10 Marines every two years. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, like, it's it's just, it's, I, I think it's one of the greatest avenues for progression for anybody wanting to push their painting. Like, I, I, a lot of people, like, when you talk to people, it's like, oh, I, I'm too scared, I'm too scared, I'm not good enough to enter Golden Demon, I'm not good enough to enter, like, things. Like, I have to say this, and again, I'll always say things extremely black and white, I, you know, 
sometimes people take me as Marmite and I don't mind that. That's fine because I'm not going to I'm not going to BS anybody like your local painting competition in your local games workshop or your local store with the greatest respect. Like it's not a painting competition in that it's still got it's still it's still got I'm I'm sorry to say it sorry to say it but the way that the way the way that I look at it is this like I I it's all about tangibility so like if you if it's like people asking their best friends to critique their painting like if your best friend is a massively better painter than you and has years worth of experience in front of you then of course their critique and feedback is really important don't get me wrong if it's Timmy down the local shop that has slaps contrast on the models because the store manager told them to, or, or do you see what I mean? Like it's about, it's about getting feedback from people that are, have, have, have got the experience to be able to go, well, you should, that looks great, but you could do this better. And, and the other thing is also feedback, which is something that I think a lot of people, um, a lot of people, it's like gets vomited at you and you can't really distinguish between like, what, what do I need to learn from if that makes sense? So when we give feedback internally, when we do training for team members or when we do painting classes, we instantly and always say there's two forms of feedback. There's something called opinionated feedback and there's something called a factual feedback. So opinionated would be, look, I'm a big Blood Angels fan. You painted the lenses blue, but they really should be green because they complement better and it looks better on the model. Um, but there's nothing wrong with blue. It's just green works, be works better purely based on colour theory. OK, so that's opinionated. All right. Factual is, look, you've left the mould line there and you've not drilled the barrel out that's that's you need to do that and sometimes when you get feedback that doesn't get passed on people just go oh do this do this do this do this do this and it's like well it, that's not really going to help you because you can't distinguish between what should i do and what's them purely saying this is what i would do if that makes sense whereas when we give feedback it's look here's the factual feedback you've not done this you've not done this here's this you should do this better that's rough you can see the brush marks you can see the texture that's what you need to fix I would have painted the cape purple because I think purple is a better color. That's opinion. And then when you separate it down that way, it's always like, right, okay, now I can know what I can choose. And I don't like purple. I'm going to stick with green, if you see what I mean. So that's kind of how I do it. But touching back onto it, like, I know I said, obviously, like local store painting competitions aren't really the best avenue for growth. Like, of course, any challenge is always going to give you some growth. But when it's somebody that has the acumen and the experience to go, this is where you're failing and this is where you're succeeding, that is the better place to have that. If you're going to invest time into painting something to your best of your ability and you're going to do it for people that maybe haven't got the experience or accolades to be able to give you the best feedback, not the right feedback, but the best feedback. If I'm going to invest time, that I'm never going to get back into something. I'm going to put it into a competition that's actually more tangible, if that makes sense. And that's kind of like what Iron Skull is all about. It's about we have a painting competition that, yes, whether you're a multiple award winning competition entrant, you can enter it and still try and go for a trophy at the highest level. If you're Timmy down the local shop that maybe just wants to get into it and start progressing, we've got a tiered prize system in the competition that gives you tangible steps on the ladder to aim for to increase your painting ability, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's, but yeah, I'm a huge advocate for competition painting. If you want to progress, get entering and start investing time into the one thing which, you, which is going to give you that tangible increase in painting ability, if that makes sense. So yeah, sorry to kind of go on about that, but it's something really close to my heart. That's yeah, that's interesting cool. to hear. <laughs> Glenn's really upset now. <laughs> I'm, sorry, now on. I'm, I'm so sorry, Glenn. I mean, <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, to be, to be completely honest, like, I literally entered that competition just to piss off another person, um, yeah. just to make sure that he didn't win. Um, but I, I see from the other side as well, what you're talking about, like the, the drive to do better, essentially, is what keeps a lot of people going because of my old gaming group, one of the guys because we used to go up to the tournaments in Nottingham for like throwing skulls and battle brothers and things like that. His goal was to not necessarily win best army, best painted army. He wanted to make it into the cabinet. He wanted to be in that top nine. Uh, and he spent uh, the entire year building up to, you know, and just seeing the progression from what he started to do to what he ended up doing uh, yeah. was, was really, really good. Unfortunately, yeah. he didn't make it in. And we, you know, relentlessly mocked him for it. But I do want to touch on that because that's also another thing. Like that, that, that in that instance, in that situation, that's still not like a loss for him. To be perfectly honest, yeah. The, re the reason why I say that is because like the 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 improvement of his painting and what he done is actually the victory. Like when you're entering a thing which is literally like, oh, we've got fifty people and they're voting on which armies they want to go into the cabinet. 
with the greatest respect, that's not really a proper competition because you've just got 50 people's opinions. It's not like someone who's goes, well, you know, look, with the greatest respect that I've seen, you know, trying to remain professional, I've seen armies that do reach that position in, in multiple tournaments or whatever. And the painting is nowhere near as good as, as, yeah. as other armies. Yeah. But that's, that's not to take away from that army that's made it to the cabinet. All that means is that, the, the, the 50 60 70 tournament goers or people just like that army that's not a bad thing you know like it's it's still good that it gets in the cabinet because people like the army the, the painting side of it is totally something separate obviously if it was purely judged by people that have got the painting acumen to go well that's got mold lines on it and isn't very smooth and that's got no mold lines on it and is very smooth and has got freehand on it that's a different arena to compete in if that makes sense so for, for your friend like I wouldn't see that as a negative. Like he still at the end of the day has that tangible thing that you take home. I've achieved this because of what I've aimed for, if that makes sense. So, so yeah, that's the way that I would look at it. Um, yeah. I just want to jump in and say that. Sorry. I just, yeah. Yeah. No, it was, the it, thing was though, it was almost, he progressed so far that the stuff he painted right at the start, you know, the, the scout squad that he'd done originally yeah. and then built up through everything. He almost had to go back and, because he'd, he'd grown as a painter and he developed his technique and everything was just that little bit sharper, that little bit crisper. That yeah, little exactly. bit um, So yeah, he had to go, sort of almost go back and sort of retouch up and do bits that he he just developed a skill over the the course of the army. And yeah. Like you say, at the end of the day, he's got a fantastically painted army. Well, that's he, it. Yeah. He can be rightly proud of it. Yeah, that's exactly it. It gives, you know, it, at the end of the day, having something beautifully painted in your cabinet and you've invested that time into is is the most return you're going to get for that time, if that makes sense, you know. And, uh, you know, if you don't get the votes that time, you can always take it again and hopefully more people will see it and go, look, I, that, your army's brilliant. I'm going to vote for it, you know. But um, in that arena, when you've got loads of mates all together, you know you're going to vote for your mates' armies because you want your mates to get in the cabinet. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's just, that's, that's that environment, unfortunately. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Cool. We've got we've only got a couple of questions left by the looks of it. Well, I'm okay. them, marking them off as I'm going down on my thing. <laughs> um, so basically, with the law side of the things, obviously getting away from the painting slightly. Do you read much black library books and things like that? And have you got like a favourite series maybe that you do read? Yeah, definitely. Like, <laughs> um, like so, I, I've got I've got loads of black library novels and books. Uh, absolutely love the background narrative. Like, um, I think that's one of the USPs of Games Workshop. Obviously, the miniatures are fantastic, but the the, the, the lore and narrative and background is really what makes us uh, fall in love with the, the game uh, and makes us buy loads and loads of miniatures, uh, which is obviously good for them. Um, but the, the reality is, is that yeah, like I, I do. I, I do have lots of books that I've read, um, but now with time being a very scarce commodity for me, uh, I tend to listen to audio books as well as uh, as well as um, paint. So I don't really, I don't, I'm, when I'm painting, I'm very visual on what I'm painting. So like, I don't want to be distracted by watching a film. We've all been there where we're, we're sitting there painting away. And then all of a sudden your favorite scene from Die Hard comes on and you're stuck there looking at it for like 10 minutes. Like, you know, and, and, and the thing is, is like, you don't, you don't realize it. You're like, oh yeah. And then you go, oh yeah, I'm painting. And then, so, so for me, it's like, I'll, I'll stick on the headphones and listen to an audio book while I'm painting, because then I can absorb the narrative uh, while I'm painting and I can concentrate visually on what I'm doing. So I'm just trying to multitask and get as much of the time investment as I can. Um, the other thing with audiobooks is that let's just say you're painting your favorite army and there's an audiobook of your favorite army. It's even better to listen to that audiobook so you can take influence. You might be listening to a bit and like what there's this paragraph or something about talking about one of the characters and he's got like some marks or something on his arm and you can just go, oh, I'll put that on my model. So like, there's loads of things you can take from the books and audio audiobooks and put them onto your models to add more value mm. onto them. Um, Favorite series, uh, I'd probably say that Aaron Dembski Bowden uh, is probably my favorite writer, being frank. Like, I absolutely love Aaron Dembski Bowden, his books. Uh, the Night Lords trilogy is incredible. Uh, Hell's Reach is one of my favorite books, obviously, with Grimaldus and obviously with the, the, the Steel Legion. Don't, don't start Dave off, sorry, but I have to say that <laughs> he's just he's just painted the Grimaldus, so yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're books, one of my favorites, like, absolutely one of my favorites, Hell's Reach. Um, but I think for series, uh, there's two, obviously, look. Again, going back to the Super Blood Angel fanboy, uh, the, all the Blood Angel stuff from the, the Heresy. So like Fear to Tread is one of my favourite books. Um, absolutely love that. All the Blood Angel books uh, are included by James Swallow. They're really, really good. I'm obviously going to fanboy over those. The Dante novel by Guy Haley. Um, all those books are great. Like The Darkness in the Blood, a lot of them. Um, but I absolutely love 
the Talon of Horus and the the the, the Abaddon trilogy or the Abaddon books that got, that uh, Amdemski Bowden's writing. Like I think the whole story behind them, the way that Kion is is like captured, like relaying the story of how the Black Legion came to be, talking about how that book for me like you you brought up obviously knowing 40k thinking that chaos marines are like these evil twisted blah blah they're, they're not all like that like there are those guys that are out there in there but that book for me made the, the the heretical marines way more human and way more like just just guys that got on the wrong side of an argument you know and and they kind of had no decision to to not go that way because if they had gone to terror they would have just been killed you know what I mean so so it's a very interesting book and really gives an a, 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 an almost other side of the mirror look to what it's like obviously everybody loves to be a loyalist because you don't we all love good you know we don't want to be bad but but it gives a really good other perspective of the mirror for all the, all the marines and I love the infighting between all the legions where everyone's going after the you know the sons of Horus and killing them the emperor's children are like really powerful blah blah like so it's just a really really good book, book series um that I that I absolutely if you haven't listened to it or haven't read it I massively advocate that you do because it's just a really good insight into a different perspective within the 40k uh, narrative um so yeah that's 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 my answer for that one sorry if it was a bit long again no. I always I'd always try and be super, super transparent with everything. So, yeah. That's awesome, man. I've, I've actually got that book. I haven't read it yet. I've, I've got hundreds of books I haven't read. I just collect them all on eBay for some weird, weird reason. Ser- but, ser- seriously, Talon the Horus, just read it. It's so good. It's like, cool. so, so good. Yeah. Well, thanks for the recommendation, man. It's awesome. Yeah. Anyone else got any questions? Yeah. I've um, gone through all mine. I was going to say, have you, have you ever um, like caught anybody trying to pass off your work as their own? <laughs> um yeah yeah we uh yeah um there's been there's been a, a couple of uh of instances um uh over eight years like um trying to remain as, as humble and as also as professional as possible it's it's always nice when when you know uh people say take inspiration from what we do and again i'd love to think that people can go on our instagram account and can look at this and see a color scheme and we get messages all the time oh, i love that color scheme i'm going to do it on my own army because i love it so much and that's always really humbling because mm. We've, cre- we've created that for our client through their car client's fishing and then someone else sees it and you know blah blah it's, it's really good um there have been instances you know over over the years where you know um that has happened uh, and again all i can say is that unfortunately as a professional business we have to go down the professional route and and get a third party involved to make sure that doesn't happen anymore um and, and to just tail it off um it's not nice doing it but again we're a business we're not here to just do it for a laugh. Like as much as it is fun, we're a business. And that's, that is the difference between us and a lot of companies in the industry. I think they are more hobby orientated. We are hobby orientated, all of us, but we're a business. And I've got staff with kids, mortgages, families, rent, all these things. And if we treated it that way, then they, that wouldn't be possible. Do you know what I mean? They wouldn't be able to have, have the things they do. So we are, we have to be that way about it. It's not nice, but, Unfortunately, it's something that we just we just have to nip in the bud when when it happens. You know, um, you know, it's it, it, even massive companies. I, I say, like, you know, in our industry, obviously, uh, remain humble. Sieges, sieges. I'd like to think well known. Um, there are companies in China and other places around the world that rip off Apple's phones and rip off Apple TVs and rip off that. It, it happens everywhere. Like you know, um, but it's kind of like it's for me. It's kind of a compliment is as crazy as that sounds because it's like we're at the point where people are like oh well i'm gonna just take what they do and pretend like it's, it's 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 a bit of a compliment so but at the same time you just have to stamp it out because you just obviously we don't want to be portrayed by other people in a negative light if that makes sense so so yeah so hopefully that answers that one yeah definitely <clears throat> what's, what's your um display cabinet like at home how, how many do you have <laughs> <laughs> i've got two um they're quite empty at the moment because most of the stuff is on my I've, I've got two at home and then i've got like just one in the office that has most of my, my stuff on it um and uh and yeah i just i always have it at work typically just because like if i need to i want to look at something or if i want to you know it's just nice to have it in the office as well because that's kind of like where it started from all that yeah. stuff that i've got you know um the, the job for me is actually filling the ones that are upstairs now which is what i want to do so, so <laughs> but but believe me i've got i've got you know, I've got a, a, a shelf in our storeroom at the office. Like I've conveniently hid in the corner of the storeroom one shelf that's got my grey shame on it. And believe me, it's bad. Like it's 
it's really bad. <laughs> so, like, um, I've promised that I'm I'm actually terrible for for not just models. Obviously, I, I've stopped unless it's something new. Primaris that's Blood Angels. I've banned myself from from buying anything. Um, but I'm actually pretty bad for buying old paint. Like, old paint is like my like. I don't drink. I've not drunk for like nearly fifteen years. But I've got like a paint larder basically and and like some people collect like fine wines i just collect super old paint <laughs> that's, that's that's kind of that's kind of like what i what i what i one of the big achilles heels to me it's I'm, I'm super into paint so yeah it sounds a bit weird but that's that's what i like so yeah <laughs> is that paint that stays sealed or do you get it out and, and use it every now and then and put it back uh sealed hex pots sealed uh old uh, like the old ones uh, yeah i've got yeah so actually i've done like a, to uh, a stock take on like my paint today this is just my my collection so to speak like and i've got like over 450 old paints that like i haven't either are either unopened or they've opened once or they're like yeah and they're all kept out of sunlight permanently sealed taped a lot so that they can't be you know, they like air can't get in like it sounds crazy but <laughs> I genuinely mean it like old paint in the future will be worth something. And I, and I, and I want to have the best collection of old paint ever. So, <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, I'm like the blood red Baron. Cause I've got so much of it, honestly. It's like, it's, it's really bad. Like it genuinely is. So yeah. So you, yeah. Do you color coordinate or is it just scattered in there? Uh, yeah. So I, I put stuff in stages on my paint rack at my paint desk. So I kind of like, I've got like my favorite, like I have like a top 10 of paints that I like, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then like, if I'm going to do green or like lenses or green lenses, I'll have like five or three different colors that I use for those. So what I'll do is I'll go, well, there's my len lens set for green. There's my lens set for blue. There's my, there's my metallics there. There's, uh, so I kind of lay it out in a way that if I'm doing steps, again, going back to this methodical painting by color process, mm steps are there in front of me so i just go that's my first color put that on that bang 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 and then next it's just, it, that, I, i've kind of indoctrinated myself into working in that manner just to be as methodical as i can if that makes sense so so yeah yeah does that translate to your collection of old paints uh no they're pretty they're pretty ramshackle to be honest oh, like no. i just like yeah I, I i did i said today i one of the things i wanted to do today was just do a big stock take on like what i've actually got so that i know and like i i realized i've got like i think it was like 28 pots of blood red in different bottles it's just it's just crazy honestly it's like, i really need to i really need help honestly like my other half she, she's like banned me from buying stuff on ebay because it's so bad like it's really like i would just buy up old collections of paint um so yeah it's, it's pretty bad but yeah <laughs> you can't pass it off as a work expense no unfortunately not like you know I, the thing is like like certain colors it sounds really crazy but like certain colors like if i don't know if you guys remember tim bits like like no matter how many times I've tried to make Timbits, like I never get it exactly how it used to be. Like the only way to get it is to use Timbits. And like, and like, again, so I've got quite a lot of that because it's one of my favorite colors, like, um, you know, but the problem, this, the, the old paint is not the scary thing. This is, this is where it gets really bad because at any point, a range of paint that's out now that I love will suddenly it might get terminated. So the problem is, is like, I'm like, I'm, I've got like in my top 10, there's about half of the 10 that are like paints that are currently in stock that are like you can buy regular just off the shelf or like you can order or whatever. The problem's going to be is when those ones get sort of axed, like I'm then going to add all these other ranges of paint that I love now into that. And it's just going to make it even worse. Like it's just, yeah, like um, my advice is do not become what I would, I don't know how, what else to call it other than a paint connoisseur. Do not be. <laughs> do not become one because it's a bad road <laughs> all right okay and the problem is it takes up way less paint way less space than models on a shelf and you can have a lot more paint on the shelf and that's the way it gets really bad so yeah just just uh, just take it easy that's all i would say <laughs> well, i think we all look forward to seeing james's museum of paint in the future then yeah. uh, I'm, I'm gonna you'll be the first guest i promise you so, yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah but yeah that's that, that's uh, that's one of the things i love very much so so yeah just when you mentioned your your other half, I've had to pull this one a couple of times. Have you ever done something at home where it's actually your own thing? It's like, oh no, I'm doing it for work. I I need to do this. Have you tried to like stealth a few little sticky models into your collection so while claiming it was work? I am very very fortunate um, that my other half uh, got somehow I got her into into the hobby, so I got her into painting. Uh, so I'm very fortunate in that, um, and I'm a big advocate. I'm a big advocate of that. Believe me, like obviously, look, having 
the, the following that we do on Instagram, when I look at the analytics, I've got a good understanding of what the makeup of the industry is in sort of male and female. Um, it's like 93% or no, I think it's 92.9% male. Like, so there's like a seven, eight percent like female demographic in the industry currently. And it is increasing, which is, which is, I think is a really, really good thing. I genuinely do. Um, so I got her into it and, uh, she, she, she works in the office. So she helps it out in the office and does a lot of things at the office uh, for, for the company. Um, but I've created a bit of a monster, to be perfectly honest, because she's never painted. And I, and I don't just mean miniatures. I meant like, like ever, ever painted before. OK. And like you do your thing where you're like, oh, you know, just just paint the model, see what it's like. And I, I, I cannot express this enough. Her first model looks better than any model I painted up until about six or seven years ago all right okay like and i was like uh, this is great because she's super into it and she's really good at it but also it makes me look terrible because she's done that like as her first model it's it's atrocious all right okay um and then and then obviously like obviously being obviously the company that we are we've got obviously lots of jobs on and stuff and i was like right well she can paint to the standard being frank which is scary like and i, I, I it's absolutely bonkers like i've never seen anything like it in anyone i've taught in anything ever and it's just ridiculous um so i was like right okay well you know we've got this character kicking about and and what we'll do is we'll paint it at the same time and whichever one's better is the one that the client will have so a little challenge like you know blah blah, blah. <clears throat> conveniently she lost the, the holster and it was actually it's uriel ventris so she conveniently lost the holster the holster it's, it got hoovered up on the uh, hoovered up at home because she brought it home to help out to basically do it in, in time outside of work and um and obviously we're painting it at the same time i was like right well you know as a penalty for losing it you can just paint the model crack on and and the worst thing is is she, she painted it so damn well uh, that, that it was good enough to, to for, for the client's commission it's just ridiculous honestly and i'm just like this is like a second model like it, it's it's mental but like on the flip side it's really good to be able to sh share that with her like i'm very fortunate that i can share that with her like i know there are a lot of people out there in the community and the hobby that don't get to share that passion they've got with their partner which i think is a bit of a shame but um but like if you can get them into it the best way is to get them into kill team or something like that or blood bowl that's the best thing um and i think just on an offshoot i love the fact that gw are giving more archetypes in the games that that the, the females can get into like a lot more female demographic in like the, you know in all the games that we're, that we're seeing and all the all the units and things that come out because i think that's been lacking in the industry for a very very long time and i think that now is the time i, I say this all the time and again i'm not trying to chew your ears off guys i realize i've had a, you know an hour and a bit of your time so i don't want to bore you on a sunday night but the reality is is that like i think we're in the greatest moment within our hobby and industry for a very very long time like um like with the release of uh, all the media that we're seeing, like obviously we've got this Warhammer Plus that's just obviously been announced. Um, like the reason we've never seen a film is because quite frankly, if Hollywood got hold of the IP, they would drive a freight train through it and it would not be the thing that we love, which is why there's no Michael Bay's with explosions all over the place happening, even though there would be explosions everywhere because it's 40K. <laughs> but, but the reality is, is that having people that love this hobby and love this narrative and the IP that are now producing content means that we are very soon going to see a full length feature film. We won't mention Ultramarines because that wasn't a very good film. But but the reality is, is that we are going to see media that's films which portray the thing we love in a visual format. And when they launches and when that happens, this industry is going to have a NASA sized rocket booster on it and grow exponentially as a result of it. It's almost like we're on the lift hill of roller coaster and we're about to go over the drop because it, it's going to happen. And when it does, this industry already now isn't this thing where it's like, oh, I'm too scared to tell people I paint toy soldiers. It's already a thing that you can go, oh, I paint Warhammer. And people are like, oh, that's cool. Like, but when the films come out and people start seeing eight foot bolt of in space brings blowing away Xenos and, and heretics, I promise you, like people are going to go crazy for it because it's so rich and so narrative. And I, and I just, I just think that we're going to have the best, it is the best industry, like the best pastime. It beats the socks off of computer games. It beats the socks off of sitting watching boring series on Netflix. It beats the socks off of everything. And I think you're going to see this industry go atomic, like a nuclear. And, and, I, and I cannot wait for it. I genuinely cannot wait for it. So, um, so yeah. So It's going to be like um, Marvel and the Avengers again, when that come and comic books just come flooding back. Well, to, we've, uh... we've, we've already got, like, we've already got the Marvel 
the Marvel already done with like Calgar. So we've already we've already got it. You know, there you go. So we've we've already got that like literally happening now. So as I said, like I think we are on the precipice of the greatest time for our our you know community and industry and hobby and and everything involved within that ever. And I and I cannot wait for films to be released because I think it's just going to make this thing so much more popular than it even is now like people love like avengers and stuff like that and to be perfectly honest the narrative in avengers don't get me wrong and i, I know there's probably a lot of people that will watch this or say that they love marvel and Nar- and avengers and all that kind of stuff but 40k is like this monolith of of narrative compared to like avengers and it's so much more deep and there's so many more characters yeah. and there's so many more like it's going to go absolutely bonkers and i can't wait for it i just genuinely yeah. can't so, so yeah yeah, I, I, yeah, I know what you mean. It's like Tom sent me some YouTube video a long time ago of like the so I think it was like a overview of the beginning of the Horus Heresy, and I just from that is is and re- reading the Horus Heresy where I'm up to now, it is so much more in depth than I don't, I don't want to say Star Wars, but it is it's like it's take it's because I love Star Wars, but it, it's sort of taken over for me. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's sort of becoming a bit bad obsession at the minute trying to get more more and more yeah i, I yeah. genuinely say this like that 40 40k as a, as a as a narrative is is more that de- has more depth than like and i look again I, I have to say this with a caveat of look i'm not a religious man or anything like that but when it comes to religious texts and things like that 40k has that depth of knowledge and background and stuff to it and then when you combine the fact that it's about all about cool models and this rich depth they don't call it plastic crack for no reason all right okay uh it's that's that's that it's the narrative as well as the incredible miniatures that make this thing so addictive and so enjoyable so so yeah awesome cool that's i think that's that's done then. yeah, uh, yeah. Do you want to wrap it up john oh uh, yeah unless anybody's got anything else james unless you've got anything I've already chatted for England like I can do, so I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to bore you guys anymore on a Sunday night. But I, I, I hope that you know I've answered anything you want me to answer. And um, and again, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you uh, for an, an honour for coming on as the first guest on your on your on your podcast on the, in this format. It really, really means a lot to me. So thank you ever so much for your time. Um, and uh, and yeah, like I said, if there's anything I can do to help you guys, like just literally drop me a message. I'm more than happy to give back as best as I can when this goes up obviously just drop me the links and i'll gladly post it from our socials and things for you and help you guys out as best i can so oh, that's awesome, really man. that's Thank really appreciated mate um and cool. yeah you have you definitely haven't bored us and um your passion definitely comes across like I'm it's, glad. Been, it's been great to have you on and thank you, uh, thank you. what a great first guest Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. So yeah. thank you ever so much. And I hope now we're out of lockdown. If if you're ever around in Nottingham or a convention or whatever, like we, we have a stand at Salute every year. And uh, if you're about, you know, swing by, say hello. It'd be lovely to meet you in in the flesh, in proper person. And uh, and yeah, if you ever want to talk for hours on end about Blood Angels, I'm the person to come to. So uh, so yeah, I, I, will, I will gladly gladly have that conversation. So yeah. Yeah. Also, and it's Salute. I've because I've. I had a couple of friends who go to it on a fairly regular basis, but I've never actually made it up myself. It's, I don't know it's in London. Normally, but. normally it's in April every year, uh, but obviously with the pandemic and things that's happened, um, that's been moved quite quite massively. Um, so it's actually going to be in November. And uh, if memory serves correct, I'm going to have to just quickly jump onto my calendar because I should know the exact date, but I don't. Um, it's Saturday the 13th of November uh, at the XL in London. So um, oh, day yeah. after my birthday. Yeah, what a day. Okay. I Night out, night, to... night out after salute. That sounds great. That sounds incredible. Sounds um, I might have to do that. Yeah. So I, I hope that if you're around, it'd be very nice to see you. And uh, and yeah, like I said, uh, it's it, it'll be nice to actually be in an environment where you can see other people than the postman. So so yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. Cool. Well, before we let you go, then if you want, uh, not that you need to, do you want to uh, plug it where we can find you and your socials and stuff? Yeah, sure. There's literally just search, just search either on Google Siege Studios or just www.siegestudios.co.uk. Uh, same again on Instagram and on other social media. Just literally search Siege Studios, and you should hopefully find us. Um, again, if you have any troubles, then just uh, just just if there's any links on this on YouTube, then that'd be great. I'd, I'll send you whatever you want. So yeah, it's fine. Um, but yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you again. So a massive thank you ever so much, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure chaps awesome Good thank James. you very much brilliant thank you. thanks a lot see you later see you yep. thank you bye thank you as always we would like to thank you for listening to our Iron and Ceramite podcast 
If you liked us, then you can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and any other good podcast services. Just remember, in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war.